ustedes porque la han estado con ella. Pero hago un pequeño recuerdo. Ella es eh, profesora de la Escuela de Computación y Sistema de Información de la Universidad de Arabasca, en Canadá. Tu área de investigación eh, son sistemas de aprendizaje adaptativos, inteligentes y personalizados. Y Sabine ha publicado más de 90 artículos en revistas de investigación, varios libros, en conferencias. Es eh, cita obligada de todos los que investigamos sobre temas adaptativos. Lo que, lo que se está metiendo y lo que no está metiendo en temas, por ejemplo, de. Bueno, ya me estoy, me estoy empleando en eh, sistemas de estilos de aprendizaje y eso es Sabine la que ha trabajado en el área. Hoy día Sabine nos presenta el Adaptive and Diligent System for Supporting Learning and Teaching. Así que adelante Sabine. Y... Okay. Thank you. Uh, good morning. So first of all, uh... I would like to thank Luis and Alicia for inviting me. Uh, it's my first time in Chile and I had some really good days and it was really great so far and I look forward to the next few days. Um, my talk will be about uh, adaptive and intelligent systems for supporting learners and, and teachers. And um, in the beginning I would like to give you a brief overview of the research that, that we are doing in my group. So I also want to highlight that what I'm presenting here today, it's, it's not only done by myself, but I'm uh, having a, uh, a research team that is uh, working on, on the issues that, that I'm presenting. It's very strongly involved in, in the research that I will present today. Um, so, in my group we look into how we can make learning systems more adaptive, more personalized, more intelligent. So, we look into different settings, so desktop-based learning, mobile learning, ubiquitous learning, look into different situations, so formal learning, informal learning, non-formal learning. Uh, one very important uh, concept that, that we are using is we, we are aiming at creating a, a comprehensive student model and, and context model that basically includes a lot of different information about a student and his or her context. So we look at things like learning styles, cognitive abilities, motivational aspects, uh, affective states, and also in, in context, we, we look into things like uh, in which context is, is a student, the environment, uh, is it silent, is it loud, is a student at home, is he or she on the bus, Think, things like that. And then try to, to combine that information and use it to provide adaptive feedback, intelligent support, things like that. Um, in our research, we look into, on one hand, of course, supporting learners through providing adaptive courses, intelligent feedback, things like that. Uh, but we also look into supporting teachers. And we do that in, in two ways. So the first way is um, when we create some adaptive mechanisms, some, some intelligent uh, algorithms, then it's very important for us that teachers, if, if they want to use it, they should have as little as possible additional effort to use it. So we found that, you know, if you say, oh, we have a really nice adaptive system, but you need to put a lot of work into using it, it's, it's probably not, not going to be used. So uh, this, this is really important for us. And the other thing is that um, we also look into how we can actively support teachers by providing them with intelligent feedback, with, with some adaptivity uh, that makes it easier for them to support their students. Um, we're using techniques from artificial intelligence, data mining, visualization, and so on. And another really important uh, concept that we're using is that we don't aim at creating another adaptive or intelligent learning system. So there are already a lot of those systems out there, and 
different reasons why, why they are not really that often used. Because if you look at what is used at educational institutions, what is broadly used, you'll find learning management systems there. So basically, in our research, we aim at extending systems that are already used, that are commonly used, with adaptive and intelligent functionalities, rather than creating our new system. Okay, um, so one, one main research direction that uh, we are looking at is considering different characteristics of, of students, and that includes things like learning styles, uh, cognitive traits, motivational aspects, context, uh, and then also looking into how we can combine all these things together. So not only having a system that can only adapt to learning styles, or only to uh, cognitive uh, abilities, but then look into how we can combine all these, these things. Um, as I said, we also look into how we can provide teachers uh, with, with some intelligent support. Uh, topics that we are looking into are making teachers, how, how we can make teachers more aware of their courses and, and the quality of the courses. Uh, how we can make them more aware of, of their students, uh, their students' progress, their students' characteristics, their needs. Um, also, we found that there's really a lot of, of educational log data that uh, systems produce in some way. Uh, but those data typically are not accessible for, for teachers or course designers. So how can we make it possible for people who have no computer science background to access those data and to look at those data? Um, and also things like identifying which students might have difficulties, which students are at risk of, of failing the course. Um, and we do this research in, in basically in, in two different settings. So one setting is learning management systems. The other setting we are looking into is, is mobile and ubiquitous learning. So in today, uh, I will present, I, I'm not going through everything here, but I will present uh, for, for uh, considering students' characteristics, I will go into more detail uh, on learning styles and, and cognitive abilities. So how can we consider learning styles and cognitive abilities in learning management systems? Um, I'll also uh, talk about uh, how we can uh, help, uh, help teachers being aware of, of their courses and, and the course quality and uh, how we can facilitate access to educational log data. And, and all that research that, that I will present today will be in the context of, of learning management systems. Okay, um, so why do we want to uh, enable learning management systems to consider or to adapt to students' characteristics? So first of all, why learning management systems? Um, so as I said, typically when you look at educational institutions or universities, schools, learning management systems are, are basically what, what they are using. And it doesn't really matter if it's for, for online learning, or so universities or schools that uh, only do online learning, or if they do face-to-face -face learning and, and uh, use learning management systems uh, supplementary for, for a kind of blended learning approach. Um, so when I say learning management systems, I, I mean systems like Moodle, Blackboard, Sakai, Etutor, um, systems like that. Um, those systems, they have been developed to support teachers to create, administer, and, and, and teach online courses. So there are a lot of features typically. You have things like putting content in, um, you have forums, quizzes, uh, chat, and so on, so quite a lot of features. Uh, typically, those systems are domain independent, so they can be used by the educational institutions for different courses in, in different domains. Um, however, what, what we found when looking at those systems, uh, they, they provide very little to no adaptivity. So, meaning that it, it doesn't really matter who is logging in, Students, they, they always get the same courses, the same 
uh, paths through through a course, the same content. So everything is the same for, for every student. Okay, so I'll, I'll start with talking about learning styles and um, we have done really a lot of research on, on learning styles. So learning styles are complex research area with several research questions still, still open. Uh, however, what, what is really clear uh, from literature and also from, from uh, experiments is that students learn in, in different ways. There are different ways in which, in which students learn. So you can't say that that's, that's one approach or these are the few, four approaches or, or whatever that in, in which students are learning. So there's really a, a broad variety. Um, what we also know is that if students' learning styles are, are not supported in, in a course, then students have problems in, in learning. And we know also from, from previous studies that providing learners with, with courses that fit their learning styles can, can help them. Okay, um, as I said, we, we did a lot of research on learning styles and the first thing we did was basically to look into different learning style models and there are really a lot of, of different learning style models out there. Uh, the learning style model that we, we selected to, to work with is a learning style model by Felder and Silverman. And the idea of that learning style model is that learners have preferences on four dimensions. So, first dimension uh, is basically active and reflective learning. Uh, active means students prefer to learn by doing something. Reflective means that students prefer more to think about the material, reflect about it. Then we have sensing and intuitive. Sensing means more that students prefer concrete material, examples, they're interested in how they can actually use what they are learning in, in real life. <coughs> intuitive means more that they're interested in abstract materials, theories, concepts, um, and, and also tend to be more, more innovative and creative. Um, then we have visual verbal, uh, and we have sequential and global dimension. And basically, each student has a preference on each of those dimensions. Um, as I said, and, and we can certainly we can measure um, the preferences on, on each of these dimensions, and Felder and Silverman, they, they proposed a scale from plus 11 to minus 11, and what, what you can see here is basically that uh, we are not saying that a student has an active learning style or a reflective learning style, but we can basically say, okay, it's, it's a strong active learning style or it's, it's somewhere in the middle or things like that. So this gives us a very good uh, approach to describe learning styles in a lot of detail. And what has been found is that if students have, have a strong preference for a certain learning style and, and there is no support for that learning style, then they have difficulties in, in learning. Okay, as I said, there, were, there are a lot of learning style models and I would like to talk briefly a little bit about why we selected exactly that one. Um, one of the reasons was that uh, Fell and Zero Man in, in their model uh, the dimensions that I explained, they, they are not really new. So they basically, they combine different other learning style models. So for example, from Kolb, Busk, uh, Meyer, Briggs types indicator. So, but what is new in that model is how the way they combine it. And especially what I pointed out already, uh, this, this concept of dimensions. So for example, if, if we look at, at Kolb's learning styles, then what they are doing is they, they have types of learners. So they have four different types of learners. They use two of the dimensions, or very similar uh, dimensions, but then they kind of characterize it in, in four different types. And uh, yeah, in my, in my opinion, uh, learning is, is really complex. So I'm not sure if, if you can really explain it in, in four different types, and uh, especially with, with adaptive systems, uh, we, we can do much more than just adapting to four different types. So, and and that's, that's what I would say one of the advantages of adaptive systems, 
that they can adapt to many different learning styles. Um, another advantage is that um, the Felder syndrome and learning style model, they also allow kind of balanced preferences. So it's not only active or reflective, but students learning side can be somewhere in the middle. Um, they also, one important thing is that they are using, uh, they're assuming that learning styles are tendencies. So it's not, if, if a student has a moderate active learning style, that doesn't mean that the student always learns in an active way. It means that the tendency is for an active way. But in some situations, they might choose to learn more in a reflective way. Uh, the learning style model is domain independent, so the idea is that these tendencies are, are independent of the domain, they go from one domain to, to another, and it's seen as flexibly stable, which basically means that learning styles typically are quite stable, so they do not change that much over time, but they can change. Okay. Um, so next I'll talk about how we can consider learning styles in learning management systems and how we can provide courses that fit to students' learning styles. Okay, so the main question that we looked at was how we can extend typical learning management systems with adaptivity based on learning styles. And the idea was that we are creating a concept that can be used in for different learning management systems. So we didn't want to just focus on one learning management system. But what we did then, of course, was to implement our approach for a particular learning management system. Uh, in this case, that was Moodle, and then evaluated it in, in Moodle. So, the aim on, and the benefits of, of, of doing that is basically that teachers, they can continue using the learning management system that they are typically using. Uh, students have additionally some uh, personalized support with respect to their learning styles. Uh, and as I said before, we really focused on keeping the additional effort for teachers as little as possible. Um, one thing we did in, in order to, to fulfill that was we, we did not consider the, the visual-verbal uh, dimension. Basically, simply because from technical point of view it would be quite easy, but uh, from a teacher point of view it would mean that teachers, they will need to create things like videos or audio files, and that's quite, quite a lot of work, so we, we did not want to kind of ask teachers to, to have to do that. Um, and the only thing they basically need to do to use uh, our adaptive mechanism is basically two things. So one thing is that there need to be learning objects in the course and uh, different types of learning objects. And we, we don't really uh, say that there need to be a certain number or there need to be a certain uh, amount of types and, and stuff like that. So it's very flexible in, in terms of what you add. So whatever works, you, you can add basically. Uh, however, the more learning objects are in the course, the, the better the adaptivity can be. So if, if you have only a few learning objects, you, you can't really do much adaptivity. Uh, the second thing we, we ask teachers to do is to annotate the learning objects. Uh, in a very simple way. So what we did was we extended the authoring interface uh, where teachers just have one additional line where they say, okay, this is an example, or this is a learning material, or this is a reflection quiz. So they kind of tell us what, what type of learning object uh, they are creating. Okay, so let me maybe show you uh, how, how our system works. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. So basically, I, I logged in as a student, and you can see one, one of our courses here. Uh, in the beginning, we have some general learning objects, um, and then we have some units, and each unit has, has some sections. <laughs> and so what you can see here, and so we have oh, okay. Um, so we have we have units. I may not use this. <laughs> okay. uh, so we have units. We have sections, and in each section we have um, uh, learning objects. And as I said, we, we support a lot of different learning op uh, types of learning objects. <coughs> we have basic commentary or outlines. We have uh, real life applications. We have the content itself. We call it uh, learning objectives. Uh, we have self-assessment quizzes, form activities, examples, reflection quizzes, additional learning material, conclusions, and there should also be some, some exercises and uh, animations somewhere. And as I said, we don't need all, all those learning <coughs> types of learning objects in, in these, these sections, but of course the more there is, the, the better. Um, so basically, what we do is we provide two different types of, of adaptivity here. So one is, you can see some of the learning objects, they are grayed out. So, and some are, are presented in, in blue color. So basically what we do is, uh, the learning objects that are in blue, these are learning objects that are either important for every learner. So content, for example, is important, uh, outlines are important, assignments are important or it's uh, learning objects that uh, work well for students' learning style. Uh, on the other hand, the, the learning objects that are grayed out are learning objects that do not work so well with, with students' learning style. On the other hand, the second thing that we are doing is basically we are changing the, the sequence in which we present uh, learning objects. So we we'll see. Okay, we always start with with the outline. Certainly, then we have one one area where we can present uh, a few learning objects that raise students' interest. Then we have the content, and then we basically have the other learning objects, and we start with the learning objects that fit best to students' learning styles. Um, so in this case, I, I logged in as a learner with an active and, and sensing learning style. So active means basically that learners prefer to learn uh, by doing something, by working actively with the material. Sensing learning style means that students prefer to learn from concrete material, like examples. For them, it's really important to see uh, how they can use what they are learning. So if, if we look at the course here, uh, you can see we, we start with uh, the outline. Then we have some, some real life applications where we basically show students how they can use what, what they will learn in, in this section, uh, which, which is important for a sensing learning style. Uh, then we have the content, then we have uh, self-assessment quizzes, form activities, examples. These are all things that work well for, for learners with an active and, and sensing learning style. Uh, and then we have reflection quiz and additional learning material, which, which does not support so well an active and uh, sensing learning style. <coughs> so, if I log in now as, as a different student, so. So I'm logging in now as a student with a reflective and intuitive learning style. So reflective means that students prefer to think about the material, reflect about it. Uh, intuitive means that they prefer to learn from abstract material, theories, concepts, they're better with readings, things like that. So and if we look at the course now, uh, you can see that the course looks looks quite different. So we start again with, with the outline, then we go immediately to, to the content, and we have conclusions, 
we have uh, additional learning material and, and reflection quizzes. And you can see that uh, the first five learning objects, they are very much about reading and reflecting about the material. So and then basically we have uh, examples, we have form activities, uh, real life applications which work either well for a reflective or intuitive learning style, and then we have uh, self-assessment quizzes which don't support those two learning styles that well. Okay, um, we also evaluated uh, this, this adaptive mechanism with uh, over 500 students, and what we basically did was switch slides. Uh, what we basically did was we had two groups of students, so one group we presented with um, the adaptive, adaptive courses and the other group we presented with, with a standard Moodle course. And what we found was that students from the adaptive course, they spent significantly less time in the course, but got on average the same grades than students from, from the standard course. And on the other hand, uh, students from the standard course, they, uh, they, they visited uh, significantly more often learning objects that we did not recommend or that were in a different sequence. Um, so that shows quite nicely that adaptivity based on learning style can provide benefits for learners. And what we basically did then was we worked together with, with other universities, with other education institutions uh, to basically implement uh, this adaptive mechanism in, in, their, in their learning process. Okay, uh, next I, I want to talk a little bit about cognitive abilities and uh, we particularly focused on working memory capacity here. Uh, and how, how we can consider that in, in, a, learning, in a learning management system. Um, so there are several cognitive abilities that, that are important when, when we are learning. Uh, things like working memory capacity, uh, in, inductive reasoning ability, associate learning skills, information processing speed. And we started basically with looking into working memory capacity in, in more detail. Um, working memory capacity enables uh, people to keep active a limited amount of information for a brief period of time. So <coughs> Miller in uh, 1956, so quite quite long time ago, uh, what he found is that people can remember seven plus minus two items or chunks of information. And seven plus minus two means it's basically a quite big range. So it means seven plus minus, so if someone has a very, has a high working memory capacity, they can remember up to nine chunks of information. On the other hand, if someone has a low working memory, then they can only remember seven minus two, so five, five items. So five and nine, it's, it's, it's almost double, right? So, so this, this can make really, really a difference. <coughs> But when we look at learning systems and, and how, how content is presented or how, how learning materials are presented, then this is not, not really considered. Um, so what we did was we basically looked into how we can consider students' working memory capacity and how we can provide t uh, students with, with automatic recommendations to individually support uh, their learning based on, on their working memory capacity. Um, and we created another adaptive algorithm where we basically looked into uh, what kind of recommendations would, would be helpful for, for learners with, with different levels of working memory capacity. Uh, when shall we provide those recommendations to students? Which recommendations should we provide at which time? and also looking into whether students actually follow those recommendations and whether they, they work for, for students. So when we looked at what recommendations would, would be helpful for learners <coughs> with uh, different levels of working memory capacity, basically we, we did a comprehensive literature review and, and we looked into uh, what, what are the things, especially in face-to-face -face learning, that, that teachers can do to increase or to help 
especially help students with low working memory capacity to kind of not, not overload them. And what we found to be key in, in this is uh, to actively engage learners in, in the learning process. So we came up with, with six recommendations that, that we can provide to basically improve the, the engagement of learners in, in, in the learning process. And, and those recommendations are basically to ask students to, to take notes when, when they are reading through, through materials, um, to request help when, when they have some questions, um, to post their ideas, their thoughts, their reflections, um, to summarize what, what they have learned, to rehearse what, what they have learned, and, and also using uh, concept maps and, and mind maps uh, to better remember the, the content. Um, then we certainly we looked into, okay, when, when do we present those recommendations? And some of those recommendations make sense before they enter a certain content. Some, so for example, note taking, if, if you present it afterwards, it doesn't make too much sense. Uh, for the other um, recommendations, usually we, we provide them after they have read a certain learning object or content. Um, and then we also have looked into uh, deciding when to show show a certain recommendations recommendation, and we use basically two two methods. So one is time based, where we look into how much time the students spend on on a learning object. Uh, the other one is probability based, where we say, okay, uh, students who have lower working memory capacity, we want to engage them more in the in the learning process. So we would provide more recommendations for, for those learners. On the other hand, if someone has high working memory capacity, we only present a few of those recommendations. Okay, and basically then we looked into, for all of our recommendations, we kind of looked into whether to present them before or after uh, the learning object, and, and also the method where we basically say, for example, um, if a student is taking not that much time uh, on, on a learning object. And one uh, recommendation that we can do is we can say, OK, can, can you remember, briefly rehash what, what you have done, uh, what you have learned here? Uh, can, can you remember the, the core, core things of what you have learned? On the other hand, uh, for example, recommendations like taking notes is something that we do. Uh, probability based. So for learners with low working memory capacity, we provide this recommendation more often than for learners with high working memory capacity. Okay, so for each type of learning object, we basically then looked into uh, which recommendation makes sense. So not, not every recommendation makes sense for, for every type of learning object. Uh, and we basically ranked uh, the recommendations on how well they, they fit to different types of learning objects. Um, and then we basically, we considered whether time-based or, or probability-based approach should be activated for a different, for a, a different type of learning object. And uh, we also considered whether a recommendation has been followed or not. So for example, if a student uh, doesn't really like one of those recommendations, we are not showing it again and again. So we kind of try to figure out what recommendations work for a particular student and then showing those recommendations. Okay, um, let me maybe briefly show you how, how that looks like in, in the course. Basically, we have again a course here, and so I'm logged in now as, as a learner with, with low working memory capacity. And so when I click on, on oh, when I click on certain learning objects, uh, system kind of calculates uh, in the back and decides on whether or not 
to provide a recommendation and what recommendation it would provide. So if I go through, through the learning objects here, you can see that <coughs> at some points I have some recommendations popping up, kind of, uh, for example here, telling if, if I have questions with, with the learning material, then, then I can uh, go, uh, go to a discussion forum and, and ask my peers or the teacher. And if I go through through different learning objects, there will come up different different recommendations, depending on yeah time time based and probability based uh, approach. Um, so next I want to talk uh, about so on how we can provide teachers with, with intelligent uh, functionality. So before I talked about learners, so now, now I'll talk about uh, what, what we can do for teachers. Um, basically, as I mentioned before, learning management systems, we see them as having been created for teachers to support them in, in doing <coughs> online education. Um, however, there, there are still some, some open issues in, in online teaching and I feel one, one of the most important issues is that uh, it's very difficult for teachers to get feedback from their learners. So in a face-to-face -face environment, it's relatively easy to, to get some feedback, uh, to see if, if students understand, uh, things like that. Um, as uh, James said yesterday, so some teachers, they kind of uh, immediately re respond to, to their learners, they change uh, the way they are teaching. This cannot really happen in, in, in an online environment. So at least currently what we see is that teachers, they usually they get very, very little feedback on their courses and how, how students are doing in these courses. On the other hand, actually we have a lot of data. So learning management systems, they store really a lot. So every time a student is clicking on a page, it's, it's stored in the learning management system database. So we have a lot of data that can tell us a lot of things about students. So we could use those data to provide feedback about learners and, and their progress, uh, about courses and, and the quality of those courses, as well as how well a certain course actually fits a certain learner. Uh, also things like finding out whether students have difficulties in a course, whether they might drop out from, from that course in, in close future. Um, so also things about mater learning material and, and, and learning objects. So we could see other learning objects that maybe cause difficulties for, for a lot of students. So this data really provides us with a lot of things we can do with it, but currently not, not really a lot is done. Um, so I want to talk about two projects that we are working on for, uh, for, for using this data. So and, and the first project is basically about uh, analyzing courses, analyzing the course quality or the course support level of students for, for, with different learning styles. So the idea is that um, Okay, when, when we create online courses, and uh, my, my university is an online university, so we have certain processes, for example, uh, when we create courses, uh, and we think about what, what we want those courses to do, how we want them to support students, um, and then we create them, and then we use them, and, and that's basically it. So there is not really a, a kind of loop where we actually look into does these courses really support learners? So what we wanted to do is basically, and, and uh, particularly with respect to students' learning styles, to look into, can, can we provide teachers with a tool that makes them aware of the support level of their courses? So uh, does a course really support students, and in this case students, with, with different learning styles? 
And we also wanted to provide them with, with a tool that where they can play a little bit around and uh, see what happens if they do certain modifications. So not doing the modification, but just seeing what, what would happen. And also then provide them with a tool that tells them, if, if they say they have time, so they, they have time to, to create, I don't know, five or 10 learning objects. So how should they use that time? What, what, what learning objects should they create? What would be most helpful for, for students? Okay, so let me show you uh, the, the tool that we developed. So and again, we, we implemented that in Moodle, and, and we implemented it as, as a plugin in Moodle. So, Okay, um, so what you can see here basically uh, in our tool we, we distinguish between two different modes. So first mode is general, so for looking into the support level of courses in, in general based on students' learning styles. Second mode is for a particular group of students, so the students that are currently in my course, uh, I, I can see how well those students are actually supported. Um, so you can see we have here the, the course structure, so which basically uh, our tool connects to the Moodle database, or learning management system database, um, and, and kind of looks into what, what learning objects are there, what, what's the course structure. So we, we have that here basically. Um, and then it basically it analyzes uh, the course structure based on how well the types of learning objects and sequence and, and how many learning objects are there, uh, how, how that works for different learning styles. And the figure you can see here, basically we have, again, the, the four dimensions of a Felder Serum and learning style model, and we have the bars here that show how well each of these learning style, each of these learning styles are supported in, in the respective course. So here you can see, for example, that an active learning style and the sensing learning style is supported quite well. On the other hand, uh, reflective and intuitive learning style are not so, not so well supported. And here you can basically see uh, uh, the overall support level, which is just an average of, of the bars that we have there. Um, so what teachers can do now, for example, is they can say, OK, I want to see what, what happens if, if I try to uh, increase or put a couple of learning objects that support more um, a reflective or intuitive learning style. So for example, if I say, okay, here I, can, I have the types of learning objects, and I can say, okay, now I want to add a reflection quiz, for example, here, and I can just drag and drop that learning object, and I can put it wherever I think I, I would put it as a teacher. And you can see the learning objects that I'm adding, they are in blue color, so that I see what, what I have added. I can add some, some more additional reading material. I can also uh, move learning objects. So if I say, okay, I want this to be maybe here, I can move that. And then I can say, okay, now show me what, what would happen. And basically what you can see here is, uh, this is the chart for before we have done the modification. This is the chart after the modification. You can see that uh, reflective and intuitive, the, the bars kind of uh, got higher, so we have better would have better support level here now. And you can also see that the overall uh, bar kind of increased. Uh, yeah, kind of increased here from from 66 to, to basically 71. 
So you can do the same on, on a section level. So if you just want to check out uh, one of the sections, you can do that as well uh, by, by just clicking on the section and it would show you additionally how well the section supports certain learning styles and after and before the modification. Um, so next I want to show you, uh, as I said, this, this is basically for learning styles in general. So next I want to show you how we can uh, make teachers aware of the support level of courses for, for their students, so for their cohort of students. So and here we use basically a, a little bit different uh, representation. So what we used here is, you see for every learning style dimension we have two bars here. So one bar basically shows uh, the, the support level of the course. So here you can see for example active and reflective learning styles, they are supported on, on a moderate level. Uh, and the second bar basically shows what the learning styles of students actually are in that course. So here you can see, for example, that in the course actually we have only students with an active learning style. So doing modifications to make it work better for reflective learning style, maybe for this course it's not so effective. But on the other hand, uh, we can see that, for example, uh, here we have uh, sensing on, on the sensing and, and, and global dimension, we have students where that are not so well supported. So in, in, blue, uh, in red color, we basically show the students that are not that well supported in the course. And, and then we can say, okay, maybe I should focus on, on creating some more learning objects for those students. Okay. Um, as I said before, we also uh, implemented a, a functionality where we basically want to say that, want to recommend uh, teachers what, what they could add. So basically, if teachers say, okay, they have time to add some learning objects, or maybe five or ten learning objects, then uh, we developed uh, an algorithm uh, that shows them what are the learning objects that would increase the support level or, maximum, or maximize the support level uh, by, by adding this certain number of, of learning objects. So basically, very similar interface here. Uh, what you could do is you could say which types of learning objects you want to add. So maybe if you say, okay, I, I don't really have time to add some uh, animations, <coughs> then you can basically just check that out. Uh, and then you can say how many uh, learning objects you want to add and basically go on get recommendation and then we have a genetic algorithm that is running in the back and kind of optimizing uh, the support level and checking out which would be the learning objects that makes most sense to add. <laughs> So, and basically what, what this does now is it shows, it recommends uh, learning objects, it recommends which types of learning objects to add, and it recommends uh, where to add those learning objects. And, and you can see again that when we check the, the overall support level, uh, it's, it's kind of increasing from, from 66 uh, to 72. Um, okay. How, how much more time do I have? Uh, yeah. Ten more minutes? I think so. Okay, perfect. <laughs> okay. So one, one last project that, that I, I want to want to show is basically um, we're looking also into how we can provide teachers and, and also course designers uh, with with easy access to log data. So as I said before, um, Learning management systems, they, they create a lot of log data. So we have really a lot of information. Um, but typically, that information is really difficult to access for teachers and, and course designers. Uh, there are kind of some, some statistics in, in learning management systems, typically. But they, they show things like when a student logged in the last time, or maybe even uh, what learning objects a student visited. But those statistics, they, they have 
some, they, they just show limited information. So one thing is that they show typically only information from, from one course. So you can't do anything that, that are kind of course, uh, cross, cross courses. So if you want to have some information about all courses in a computer science department or all undergraduate courses or just all the courses that I'm teaching, so you, you can't really do that. Uh, another thing uh, that is a problem is that basically these statistics, they show what other people thought would be interesting for teachers. And they don't really, sh yeah, th this kind of limited information, they don't really show you everything. Um, so basically, uh, we looked into how we can uh, provide users or who, have, who don't have a computer science background with all these locked in <coughs> and, and how we can make it easy for them. Because currently, I mean, of course, it's, it's, it's a matter of, of getting access, but if, if someone gets access to a data, Moodle database, for example, there is so much data in there, so you, you can't really see anything. So how, how can we make it possible that teachers and, and course designers, they can go through this, this data and, and uh, get some information out? So basically, the, the approach that we wanted to, uh, that we aim at, is basically that teachers, they, they can ask questions to the database. And the idea is that they start with some, some generic questions, and then they go more and more into detail. So for example, if a, if a teacher says, okay, I, I want to know something about how well my quizzes work. So they can basically say, okay, so show me show me the average grades of, of the quiz, of quiz questions. And then they get a list with, with all their questions and, and the average grade of students. And then they can say, for example, okay, now show me only the quiz questions where students got, on average, less than 70%. Then you have a list with, with questions that are difficult for students. And then you can say, okay, now show me what, what types of questions are that. Or you can say, show me what's, what's the content, what, what sections do these questions belong to. So you can kind of, imp kind of zoom in into the information that, that you actually are interested in. Um, the idea is that the tool should work for different learning management systems. So it basically just connects to the database and then extracts the data that, that teachers are interested in. And the idea is to facilitate teachers learning about uh, their teaching strategies, about their courses, and also course designers learning about their course designs. And when I say course designs, uh, I don't mean so much uh, learning designs, but what uh, James talked yesterday about, so sequences of, of learning objects, things like that. I'm talking more about general things. So things like, for example, um, that we present assignments, for example, you could present them in the very beginning so that students see them immediately, or you can present them within the course structure. So things, things like that. So more, more general stuff. Okay. So, so the procedure basically is in, in, in the tool that we developed is that we first uh, ask users to build a kind of profile or, or experiment, you could say, and in this profile, we ask them for, for basically three things. So we ask them to select the learning system they want to connect to. Uh, so which is basically just selecting, okay, I want to connect to Moodle 1.9 or Moodle 2.2 or whatever. Um, then the data set they want to do the analysis on. So basically they can say, okay, I, I select certain number of courses or I want to uh, look at courses in, in my department, or I want to look at all undergraduate courses, stuff like that. And then we asked them to define the, the, we call it patterns or queries, or questions basically, that they want to ask to the data. And I briefly want to show you a few screenshots. I don't want to show you the full tool because it's, it's uh, yeah, quite, quite comprehensive. But I show you a couple of screenshots on how to, to kind of ask those questions. So, so basically, when, when a teacher wants to create such questions, then they have four possibilities. So they can start from scratch and create a new question, or they can uh, 
create the question based on a question that they have asked before. Uh, they can merge kind of two questions to say, oh, I, talk, I asked here about forums and I asked here about uh, quizzes, so I want to kind of merge them and build on this then. That's, that's what they can do here. And they can do some analysis on, on a particular question or on the result of a question. Um, so when they start with, with a new question, the first thing we ask them is, so what, what concepts are you interested in? So are you interested in, in uh, quizzes or, or forums or resources or learners themselves or the course? Uh, the second thing we ask then is kind of the attributes. Um, so things like, okay, if, if you have a course, what's the course name, what's, what's the uh, course opening date? Um, for forums, it would be probably what, what are the postings themselves, things like that. And you can also see that here uh, we present a, an example of the data that, that they selected so far, so that they can immediately check, is, is that uh, attribute really what, what I want to, to ask here? And then basically they can add some limits, so they can say, okay, I'm only interested in, in this case, for example, in, in certain courses with, with a certain start date, or, or data with, with a certain start date, uh, kind of adding some, some, some limits on, on what, what they are actually interested in. Uh, and then basically this, they, save, they save the pattern and, and they can run it. Um, and then as I said, uh, there is possibly, to, uh, the idea is that teachers, they create simple patterns in the beginning and then they kind of build on, on those patterns. So what they can do is, as I said before, they can build on one pattern, so that would mean they kind of select the pattern and then they go through, through a similar process again. Uh, or they get basically they merge two patterns, which means basically they just select those two patterns and, and that's it. And then we have analysis as well, so where they can do analysis on an existing uh, pattern or, or question, or result set of a question. And at, at the moment we, we are supporting a quite, quite simple set of, of analysis that they can do. They basically they can count, they can sum, uh, can do an average and, and mean and max. And what they can do, for, and then they can basically select, okay, um, say something like, I want to count all the forum postings per student. I want to count all the forum postings per course. So, so things like that. Mm. Yeah, and, and as you can see, uh, we also, we, we always uh, kind of show what, what the result set would be. So here basically in this screen you can see what, what would be the result. So if, if you do something where you say, okay, I'm not really sure if it, is this attribute or the other one, so you can see that immediately here. Okay, okay I think that's, that's basically it. So, thanks a lot and I'm open for questions. Okay. Uh, one or two questions, and after that we will go to the room C to, if, if you want to do more questions. Una pregunta general. Bueno, vamos a hacer otro aplauso también. Sorina, this is for you. Some picture of uh, our university. Thank you. Uh, Chile have a nice wine. Okay. So this is a set for for to uh, drink oh. wine it's for you. Oh, thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. I would wine. Uh, you need to mm. know the temperature. Okay. Of the wine. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And this is for you also. Okay. 
James, uh, it's important for you. <laughs> Amile, I know that you have uh, also good, uh, good wine in Australia, okay? So, you don't need any explanation about this thing. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs>